Hello, Brother and Wildlife Trust. Uh, so welcome to everyone uh, this evening and uh, really hope you enjoy um, uh, uh, David's talk and our um, slideshow this evening. Um, so just before we um, get going, I'm just going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're going to do this evening. So, um, just to start off with, uh, we've got Tanya Shelley and some other staff from the Trust alongside us. Um, and <laughs> getting a bit of feedback, so could everybody just check and see that they're on mute? So please try and put yourself on mute. So you can do that by just scrolling down and you'll see a little microphone. Uh, it looks at it on the left of the toolbar and if you click on that it should put a line through it and that puts you on to mute and you should just get a little red line I can see a few people are still trying to sort that out so so if you can do that that would be great okay so uh, we've basically got some trust some other trust staff alongside us this evening um, so they'll be helping facilitate the session uh, and we've got a question and answer session later on so um, our plan this evening uh, will be to um, sorry just hang on a moment just getting a text through yeah so uh, our plan for this evening will be, um, I'm going to just give you a bit of a brief introduction about some of the uh, trusts, urban sites and urban uh, birds that we see here in Sheffield and Rotherham. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass over to David as soon as I can. Uh, and he'll uh, hopefully be speaking for something like uh, uh, 45 minutes or so, I think. Something like that, David, does that sound about right? Uh, and then uh, we'll have um, time after that for some questions, probably 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. And as we go through um, the, the presentation from David tonight, if you've got any questions uh, and you think of anything as you go along, then the best thing to do is to put them into the uh, chat section, which um, you should be able to find under more if you can't uh, e immediately see it. Um, and uh, that is the place to type in questions and later on we'll look at those questions and pick out some of them to put to, put to David uh, for his, his answers. So uh, just before I um, start, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some, um, uh, um, Zoom keeping as we're calling it. So uh, for our Zoom keeping, um, please just, uh, as I said um, just then, please ensure <laughs> uh, because if you don't stay on mute, we get echoes and repercussions. So please do try and work out how to, um, how to, to uh, uh, put yourself onto mute if you can. Uh, and then um, uh, apart from that, I just need you to also uh, um, make sure that, as I mentioned about putting the, the questions into chat. Uh, and then the, the other final thing is, is that if we have any kind of technical issues, so for instance, if you find that you drop out or your broadband drops out, then you know don't panic, please just try and come back in. You should be able to just rejoin uh, once your broadband uh, sort of gets back up and going uh, and of course you know that also applies to us if we have any technical difficulties or for some reason David does and we, we end up dropping out then please just bear with us and um, uh, you know usually these things get resolved in a matter of a few minutes so so just um, kind of wait uh, and, and try again and, and hopefully it will get resolved. Uh, but hopefully we won't have uh, any any more problems uh, this, tonight. Um, so uh, fingers crossed. So um, just before I pass over to David, I'm just going to um, share a few uh, slides from uh, the trust uh, about some of our um, nature reserves. So um, 
just try and uh, make this as big as I can. So hopefully you can all see that. Uh, if anybody um, can give me a, a thumbs up as if they can see it. Great, I'm getting a thumbs, some thumbs up. So that's good, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, so welcome to this evening, as I said. Um, and we're you know, really excited to have uh, David uh, here with us. So um, really looking forward to that. So I just wanted to uh, talk about some of the fantastic urban birds that we, we have here in Sheffield and Rotherham. And, and we're very fortunate uh, at the Trust to have a number of really great urban um, uh, nature reserves that we look after. And you might not be able to see the detail of this map, but basically in the middle is Sheffield city centre. Uh, and we have um, a little spot here, which you just to the north of Sheffield City Centre, which says Crabtree Ponds, uh, which is up near the Northern General Hospital. If any of you know that area, there's a little tiny nature reserve there, which is great for urban birding. And over to the to the to the west, um, sorry, to the east, we have Centenary Riverside over towards Rotherham Town Centre, which is fantastic as well. We have a tiny site called Salmon Pastures, and we also have our first ever nature reserve, Sunnybank, which is right in the heart of the city centre too. Great places for urban birding. So uh, what, what do we see there? Well, this is a great shot by um, one of our nature reserves manager of a kestrel. We, you know, quite a common bird these days to see kestrel, and we see those on our nature reserves very much. But, um, particularly uh, at um, Centenary Riverside, we've seen kestrels this year. Um, but we've also seen things like uh, the breeding reed, breeding reed warblers, uh, reed bunting and white throat, perhaps things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with, with an urban area. And then over winter, we, we get red wing and field fare, which are, which are relatively common now. Uh, but we have also had uh, water rail, which is pretty unusual to have somewhere so near to the city centre. Then we've, uh, we have birds that you, I'm sure, will be familiar with, such as this lovely missile thrush, which we found on sites like Sunnybank, again, right in the heart of the city. And crab, crab tea ponds has also had uh, these, these lovely missile thrushes as well. And in fact, we, uh, some of you may know our offices at Victoria Hall, and we had a lovely thrush uh, decided to make a, a nest on top of the security light there and uh, it looked uh, very at home and had a very successful uh, breeding season there a couple of years ago so they they really can adapt to to the urban environment and at Crabtree Ponds we've also had things like nut hatches, gold crest, black cap and uh, kingfisher and things like uh, nut hatch you might well see in your your own gardens of course and then a bit sort of away from our sites, more generally across Sheffield and Rotherham in the urban areas, we increasingly see the kind of now ubiquitous invaders like the ring-necked parakeets, and you probably hear those. Uh, they're quite showy, you know, very bright green, um, but they, they never used to be around this area, but increasingly they've worked their way north. I think they escaped from a zoo in London, as the story that I heard. Uh, maybe David knows more about that than me. Um, but Sheffield in particular, I think, is known for its wax wings. We're very lucky to see these beautiful birds coming in in the autumn time, stealing those lovely red berries. And, uh, you know, we, we see some flocks of those. So, so they're re really lovely to see in Sheffield. And finally, I just want to mention some of the kind of real city dwellers that we might be more familiar with as well. Uh, that have traditionally lived alongside us, but have increasingly disappeared. So, for example, I'm thinking of things like the starling. Uh, we used to see flocks of starlings. They used to be seen as pests sometimes in the city centre, and things were, were done to try and get rid of these pests in the city centre. Unfortunately, um, it was all uh, actually worked quite well, and really we, we have seen a big decline in starlings uh, in the area. But but they are coming back and making a bit of a recovery. And then house martins and of course swifts. And uh, some of you will know about the swift awareness uh, campaigns that go on during the spring. And uh, you know, please do find out more about those. And there are some local swifts groups in Sheffield and Rotherham that we hope to be doing more with as well. 
but it's in part down to these sort of changes in our urban areas and how our houses and gardens change that we have lost some of these birds the way that the um building of our houses we no longer have some of the, the wooden gutters and eaves that, that used to be great places for house martins and swifts to nest so here at Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust we're constantly looking for for ways to encourage local authorities developers businesses you our members and our our supporters and homeowners to, to make a bit of space for nature it just can be a very little bit of space in an urban area that can make all the difference it could be a, a bird box it could be a hedgehog highway cutting a hole in your fence with neighbors to make sure that hedgehogs can move between in your gardens it could be putting a pond in your garden it could be uh, anything just very simple even a little window box can make a difference but there's always a chance to put some more space in your patch for nature so do try and uh, think about that as we listen to David's talk and do feel free to find out more from the Wildlife Trust about some of those things so um, now I'm going to uh, just pass over to, to David, who's going to tell us much more about urban birding than I have. And just to introduce David, he's uh, a broadcaster, a uh, writer, obviously a speaker, an educator. Uh, I um, brought up in London. I think you're currently residing in Spain, David. Apologies if I've not got that right. Um, and he's, of course, the author of The Urban Birder and other sort of books along those sort of subjects. Um, he regularly presents on TV and radio. And I understand he was recently named the seventh most influential person in wildlife by BBC Wildlife magazine, which is fantastic to hear. So, David, I'm going to stop my uh, present, presenting my uh, um, uh, PowerPoint and I'm going to uh, hand over to you to, to hear all about urban birding. So, David, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Liz, for that introduction and thank everyone. I'd like to thank everyone, should I say, for being here tonight. It's always a bit weird talking to your computer screen like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always used to sort of standing and waving my arms in front of people, but to do it in your own home is a bit strange. Now, let me find out, can you see anything? Because I'm trying to share my screen now, Let's see if I can do this. Can you see it? Good, okay. Well, thank you very much for the Sheffield and Rotherham uh, Wildlife Trust for inviting me tonight. I too have been looking forward to being here to see you guys and to talk about urban birding. What I thought I'd do tonight uh, is to talk about um, four different places, four different urban centers I've been to around the world, just to talk about some of the things I saw and some of the issues and positives that these places have. Um, by the way, this image, um, if you haven't seen it before, um, it was in Notting Hill and this really weird that guy in the stripy jumper looking up to see what I'm looking up at because it's interesting when you walk down a city street, not many people actually look up. They're looking down or looking into shop windows to see how stylish they look, but never look up. You could be standing naked on the first floor of any building and no one will notice you. That's how it is. Always look up, it's a good thing to do. Right, let's see if I can, uh, oh, okay. I started young. Um, this is me, um, I don't know how old I was, actually I can't remember, but um, I was pretty young. I was born with a, an interest in natural history. Um, it started off with invertebrates um, and it kind of developed from there into birds. Um, but all along my sort of early interest, I had no one around me that shared my interest. I had no one like my parents or, or anyone. So I kind of taught myself, I didn't have a mentor, so I taught myself. Um, and basically, I was always told from a young age that to see wildlife, you need to be out in the middle of the countryside, but I had no one to take me. So I kind of inadvertently became an urban birder by looking around me because I was, I was raised in Wembley, um, a stone's throw from the stadium. So it was fairly urban, as you can imagine. Um, by the age of around about maybe seven, I went to my local library in my ever 
lasting quest uh, for knowledge. And I discovered uh, birds of Britain and Europe with North Africa and the Middle East. And I'm sure one or two of you may have that book or had it in the past. And I couldn't believe it. It was amazing to see so many different species in one book. I didn't realize there were so many. So I read this book inside out, back to front, sideways, upside down. I read everything and I learned about all the birds. I knew their scientific names. I knew how big they were or are in inches. I still do to this day. The sparrow is five and three quarter inches and the carrion crow is 18.5. I know it all now. And plus I knew all the scientific names as well, but unfortunately a lot of them have changed. In fact, the order of many of the books have changed now. I, I'm an old fashioned type of guy. I like the idea of having divers and greaves in the beginning and ending up with buntings, but now it starts with ducks and then there's kestrels and it's just all weird now, but uh, I like the old style. So maybe a year later, I came across birds of town and suburb um, by the late Eric Sims. Uh, Eric Sims was a prolific writer. Um, he worked for the BBC. He did a lot of sound recording and shows about wildlife and birds in particular. He wrote a million books, but this one, when I read it at the age of eight, I was a bit too young to understand it. So I kind of read it several times over, but it was my first, unbeknown to me, it was my first manual on urban birding. It talked about birds being seen in places that you didn't really expect, like in back garden, to allotments, to car parks, to landfill sites, all the places that you didn't really expect in those days because it was all about going to the famous hotspots like Minsmere and Dungeness and you know places like that, Isle of Mull. So it was really interesting for me and it taught me also about local patches. So I'm gonna fast forward now. And by the way, these two books, and I've often said this, and I hope no one from the Brent Library services listening or watching, but these two books are still in my possession. Um, I have tried to return the books on a couple of occasions. The last time was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but the library was closed down. So what do I do? I can't leave them outside in the steps. I must have kicked them until such times I can give them back. So um, to cut forward a few years now, um, I'm gonna run straight to London, or keep in London actually, and show you, or uh, take you around even my local patch my current local patch, which is Wormwood, Wormwood Scrubs. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay, it's there. That's Wormwood Scrubs there. And as you can see, it's the only bit of green um, for miles around, really. And dead south here, this is the London Wetland Centre. Now, I first turned up at the scrubs in the, in the late 80s. Um, I saw it as a piece of green on a map. And at the time, no one really was birding there at all. But I found it interesting because it seemed to have some kind of promise. Now, just to quickly run you through, this whole area is 181 acres. The western half of the scrubs is the most interesting, especially this area here, which is a grassland. And here along the embankment, which used to hide the Channel Tunnel, um, there's trouble afoot, which I'll tell you about later in terms of development, but anyway, I've been traversing this area since, since the late 80s. And to date, we've seen 150 different species, um, some incredible species. I've been mean, seeing a whole range of waders, for example. I've seen wimbrel, curlew, common sandpiper, little ring plover, ring plover, uh, golden plover, red shank, green sandpiper. Um, it's incredible the amount of birds we've seen, and part of that could be due to the fact that it's directly north of the London Wetland Centre, and I believe that birds are just making a beeline, and they sometimes stop off. And by the way, the uh, Wormwood Scrubs has no standing water at all, so it's incredible that we've seen so many of those types of birds. So this is what, this is what the scene was back in the early 90s, very bleak. Um, a lot of the uh, area is actually uh, playing fields, but the grassland area which exists now used to be mown within an inch of its life every autumn. Just as the numbers of pipits and skylarks were gathering, it would just be mown the next day. I've turned up and it'd be like this, and it was gutting. And the reason for that was that it was owned by or run by the MOD. 
But in 2001 or 2002, we had a lucky sort of accident in that, um, or happy accident in that the MOD left to go elsewhere and then the grass was allowed to grow. So it became a lot more wilder overnight. But I love coming to this place because I imagine that I'm in Norfolk or on the Isles of Scilly. And it's interesting when you're in an urban area and you start birding, you have to kind of imagine the landscape as a bird would. So forget about the fact you're in the middle of the city, forget about the fact you're in the middle of Sheffield, but look at the landscape as a bird would. So if you see a bush, that bush could contain food. And as far as a bird's concerned, that's, that's all it needs. And to give you a really interesting example, back in the early 2000s, I took the then Birdwatching Magazine editor to my patch. We were walking around in the morning and we walked past the only gorse bush on my patch. And I said to him, if only a Dartford warbler was in that bush. And he laughed. And then the bush shook and out popped a Dartford warbler. The guy couldn't believe it. He said, oh my God, I can't believe it. It's, it's a lifer. I don't need to go to Arn now to endorse it. I've just had a lifer. So it shows that if you open your mind to the possibilities of birds turning up in urban areas, then you see anything. I mean, when you think about in London, for example, there's been 360 different species really seen in the urban area. Um, in Britain, there's been 620 species on our list, of which about 95% have occurred in urban areas. One of my favorite, in fact, this is my favorite bird, the ring ousel, but one of my favorite stories I love to recount is the fact that the bird that I've always dreamt about seeing, if you remember when I told you about that book I got from the library, Birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, and I went through the pages, I remember seeing that plate with the ring ousel and blackbird on it, and I was thinking, when will I get to see a ring ousel? Because I read the, uh, the, the text and it looked like a blackbird to my little mind. But then obviously it's a very different bird in that it's very shy. Um, they uh, are summer visitors. They hang out in really uh, remote areas like the Cairngorms and Dartmoor and Snowdonia and places like that. And plus I'm sure around your way as well. Um, but they're difficult to find compared to blackbird, which has eight to nine million pairs. This bird, what, 7,000, 8,000 pairs and decreasing. I thought, when will I ever see one? And one fateful day, I remember having a dream the night before, it was in April 15, 16 years ago. I dreamt I saw ring on my patch. I went to my patch that following morning thinking, this is crazy. And I walked around and I saw a few of the uh, usual uh, suspects in terms of migrants like white throat and black cap and stuff like that. And as I was about to leave, I turned. And as I turned, something flew over my head. I looked from my binoculars and there, filling the whole frame, the whole vision was a male ring ousel standing right in front of me. My, my favorite bird had come to visit me. And that's been the case ever since. Um, every year they turn up. And it shows that if you, if you actually visit a site that no one goes to and start watching it, keep it as your local patch, you'd be surprised as to what sort of birds turn up. And this is one big surprise for me. Another bird that I love seeing uh, in the spring and autumn passing through my patch is the, the wheat ear. Um, for me, it's one of the harbingers of uh, summer for me because they turn up um, on the football pitches or on the grassland where I am at the scrubs and after a while they melt away, but it's just great to see them. Now, I mentioned there was a bit of trouble afoot and unfortunately there is. Um, just want to show you basically this is the western end of the scrubs this is the grassland area and the embankments along here so this area here is by far ornithologically, ornithologically the best area i've had all sorts here Dartford warbler we've had short-eared owl practically every year not necessarily staying even though one did stay for two weeks which i couldn't believe because this area is traversed by dog walkers all day long so i don't know how that managed to stay there but snipe sharp here we've had woodcock in well, the grassland, but also here and in the little woodlands here. So it's incredible the amount of birds that show up. But um, as you may know, uh, you, HS2 and others have raised their, well, for me, ugly heads. Um, and what's happening north of the scrubs is that they are redeveloping, which is fine. However, it's going to look like 
Croydon meets New York with some of the skyscrapers there. So it's going to be a pretty ugly skyline. But um, the uh, HS2 people want to build a station twice the size of uh, Waterloo here. And they want to kind of dig this area up here to put a sewer in. And at the same time, London Transport want to place a train line along the top here, running along here. So it doesn't look like much in terms of just clipping the edge, but in reality, um, we've found recently that the plans are actually to go way deeper into the scrubs, because obviously they're going to bring their heavy vehicles and stuff. It's going to totally destroy the character. They say they're going to put it back as they found it, but I don't see God written on their t-shirts anywhere, so I can't imagine that happening. So at the moment, there's a massive fight going on, and I'm sure it's going to intensify. So that's a, a sad thing, really, because it's a place that I love, and I'm, you know, I feel very heartbroken thinking about it. But um, one of the, the things that actually is helping the scrubs, funny enough, is, is this bird. Um, Liz mentioned it earlier, the ringneck parakeet. Um, I will say on record, not one of my favorites. I'll say that now. Um, I find them very noisy. They're green, they've got long tails. And the other thing is, um, about the noise, um, they drown out the dawn chorus. Um, we didn't have any maybe 10 years ago, and then all of a sudden they started coming, and now we have a roost of sometimes up to 3,000 birds. So they've really kind of increased. But what's interesting is these birds have drawn in a lot of the locals because they come to watch the spectacle of the, of the birds flying into roosts, which is, I must admit, quite a great thing to watch. And uh, it's introducing people to the scrubs. It's introducing people to nature. So hopefully it's introducing people to the struggles that the, the site's having, and hopefully they will stand behind us. Um, and also to answer the question that Liz raised earlier about the origins of the uh, ring net parakeet, it's quite interesting. There's been lots of theories as to how they showed up in the UK, uh, predominantly in London. One is that they escaped from the set of the African Queen, in Shepparton, but I believe it actually wasn't Shepparton, it's was Pinewood, but anyway, one of the two. Um, another theory is that, or myth, is that uh, a plane that was, uh, was flying over southwest London back in the 60s and part of the fuselage fell off and landed on an aviary, and then all the parakeets escaped. Another myth is that, um, and this is quite a sexist one actually, so I don't, I don't, I don't actually agree with this one anyway, but. Husband and wife having an argument. Husband's a keen bird fancier. Uh, the wife, out of spite, leaves the cage open and all the birds escape. Uh, my favorite is uh, Jimi Hendrix in 1969 on Carnaby Street with Adam and Eve. He lets them both go. 40 years, uh, 40 years later, 40,000 parakeets. That's a, a much better <laughs> and more romantic uh, theory. Um, in reality, uh, it's pretty boring, uh, the truth. The truth is they are escaped pets. But what's interesting is the first actual recording of breeding in the UK was back in 1853 in Great Yarmouth. And towards the end of the 1800s, there was a thriving uh, colony uh, in North Fleet in Kent. Um, they were on sailor ships, and when the sailors came and landed, at dark, they just fall off. The reason why parrots of this sort can survive, because people think of parrots as being tropical birds hanging out in steamy jungles. In reality, there's over, I think, 350 different species. And of course, some are tropical and subtropical, but then there's others that actually hang out in alpine type terrains, like the, uh, the kia in, North, uh, in New Zealand. Um, the ring neck parakeet is found predominantly in India, as well as a sliver of Eastern Africa, but they actually, in India, they're actually found up to 4,000 feet up in the Himalayas. So they're used to <laughs> pretty extreme weather. So it means that the weather in England is literally a walking apart for them. And on top of that, we feed them. We're so lovely to them. So that's part of the reason why they're spreading so gleefully north. So I wouldn't be actually celebrating if I were you, but anyway, they're on their way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk now, I'm going to leave London and come to where I am now, actually. I'm talking to you from Spain. 
But when I mention that, people think or have a vision in their mind that I'm lying on the beach somewhere hot, sipping, you know, pina coladas and dipping my toes in the lapping sea. Well, I couldn't be further away from that. I'm actually in an area called uh, Extra Medulla. I'm going to zone in. Actually, let me just see if I can can't even go back. Oh, I can go back. Extra Medulla is basically around here. It's the fifth largest region in Spain, and it's just south uh, west of Madrid and north west of um, Seville. And I'm actually right there, so I'm going to show you a close map. So that's Badajoz. This is where I am right now, a place called Merida. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Extra Medulla. It's one of the most uh, famous spots for birding in Spain, maybe tying with Andalusia but it's also one of the best places for birding full stop in Western Europe, along with neighboring uh, Portugal around this area and also Andalusia. Um, it's incredible the numbers of birds you can see here. Um, the, the habitats are quite interesting too. Extra Medjuda is actually twice the size of Wales or the size of Switzerland if you're European or just under the size of Kentucky if you're in America. So it just shows you the size of it, yet there's about 900,000 people that live there. So it's actually very sparsely populated. It's got a really low pe person per kilometer rate. I think it's like 14 people per kilometer. Um, and the habitats range from what you saw previously, which is in the height of the summer, um, when it gets pretty hot. I mean, you can go up to 44 degrees and the, the landscape becomes blonde. Whereas in the spring, there's some beautiful, um, you know, meadows that suddenly flourish. And this is, just, this is just outside Merida, so literally on the edge of the city. And in these fields, you can hear quail calling. Um, in the trees, you can hear wood, uh, you can hear, well, you can hear wood pigeons, of course, but like turtle doves and, you, you know, different warblers like um, Sardinian warblers and black caps and Western subalpine warblers. It's an amazing place. And everywhere you look, there are birds, you know, especially this time of year in the autumn, a bleak winter when you go into the country some of the uh, the bushes just explode literally with uh sparrows fatty sparrows and corn buntings it's just incredible that's the cattle egret um currently at the moment around a lot of the the river edges and some of the the wetlands that are well basically the rice fields um blue uh, blue throats are fairly common now they're birds that you we struggle to see in the uk but in in urban even in urban uh, areas you can find them in any kind of wetland area during the winter and they are absolutely stunning to watch. Uh, this time of year also um, lapwings come. Um, in Spain they call them ave, 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 fria, ave fria which is cold bird because they come during the winter of course. They don't actually breed even though there's plenty of uh, place for them to breed actually I'd say. So they come in great numbers along with lots of uh, lesser blackback gulls from the north and black-headed gulls. They're the two predominant gulls you have uh, in extra Medjuda. And in the wetlands, um, i.e. the rivers and the, uh, the marshy um, rice fields, you get lots of waders. I mean, uh, literally last week I was on the outskirts of Merida and I had in a rice field over 200 rough, of which these are, along with dunlins and tons of lapwings and uh, black wing stilts. I mean, it's just amazing to see all these birds. And there's some of the rough, a bit close up in a rice field. Um, the city I'm based in, um, I don't actually live here. I'm, I'm kind of, I was stuck here this year because of coronavirus. I was, I was meant to be sort of coming to England and I ended up being in Spain for five months. Um, so it's kind of a lucky, a lucky accident really in a way. But, um, I've been finding lots of little spots around the city where there's just no one birding for a start. I mean, there's very few actual uh, resident birders in the whole region. And the places are to yourself. You can spend the whole day and not see anyone. Um, this time of year also, there's lots of cranes coming in. Uh, they winter in the region, and I even see them flying over the city. There's approximately 150,000 that winter in the region. So it's one of the most important spots in Western Europe for this particular species. And they are absolutely stunning. I love, 
the, the evocative sounds that they make and they hang out in family groups. The young birds have browner heads, these are two adults, but they are absolutely amazing to, to wait for in the autumn. In fact, um, the Spanish and especially people in extra Nigeria call them ladies in grey because of their elegance and they're revered. I mean, they really are revered. Um, what they tend to do is they feed in the rice fields. At this time of year, the rice fields are harvested. So if you remember that previous picture with the rough, the fields are very much like that, waterlogged, and they're, they're feeding on bits and pieces there. And in the later part of the winter, i.e. January, February, they move in onto the farmland, so onto what they call the dehesa, which is where they have the, um, the oak trees, the home oak trees, and they keep uh, pigs, the Iberian black pig, which runs around basically feral, um, and the, uh, the, the cranes feed on acorns. So they find plenty of food currently. So this is Merida. Um, it's the capital city of Extremadura. It has a population of approximately 65,000. And by the way, currently Extremadura is enjoying, if that's the right word, um, very little in the way of coronavirus. It's one of the least hit areas, along with Bolivia, uh, the Balearics, and the Canary Islands. Uh, I think currently, as far as I know, 40 people um, have been infected, so it's very low at the moment. So, um, yes, this is uh, Merida. It's the city with the most amount of Roman ruins in the whole of Spain. In fact, back in the day when the Romans were around, this was the capital of Rome outside of Rome. And this bridge is uh, very um, aptly called the Roman Bridge. It's the longest an oldest bridge still in existence in the world. It's just over a kilometer long, it's pedestrianized, and it's one of the hot spots people come to when they go birding in extra mature. Um, it's, for me, it's one of the spots, because there's many, many spots within this city that you can go to, but for most people that just come here and stand on the bridge, because it's a great place to see things like Western Swamp Hen. And here I am leading a group a few years ago standing and I think we were actually looking at Western Swamp End. The river, by the way, is called the Guadiana River and it flows through the middle of the city and empties out in Portugal, in the south of Portugal. So it's a very long river, very good in some areas, some areas of the river, absolutely brilliant for, for birding. And the Western Swamp End, this area here, is the best place in the whole of Extra Nigeria to see them, right in the heart of the city. And this is my patch. My patch starts from that Roman bridge and heads, if you can imagine, to the north towards this bridge, which is called Lusitania. And the side we're standing on is a park, which is called the Park of the Seven Seats. And it's actually um, quite interesting, even though most of it is manicured. In 12 months and visiting maybe 10 times, I've seen 112 species in one year. So it's incredible the sort of things you see here and it's uh, as you see it's a, it's a very nice pleasant park not really heavily visited um, I'm because I'm English I tend to go there at the wrong times of day when it's hot and sunny when people are having their siestas so maybe that's why I don't see anyone um, and it extends further on down the river so it's quite a nice spot and in these reeds um, you get things like uh, <clears throat> excuse me like little uh, bittern and June of summer great reed warbler and purple swamp, so purple swamp, and of course, but purple heron as well, uh, little egret. And the other day, I found a squacko heron, which was quite late. Um, this time of year, large numbers of uh, cormorants gather along the river. You can see several hundred at a time. And as you can see, some of them, like these ones here, are the continental race with the lot of whites on their head. The, uh, the, the um, scientific sub name is Carbo. Um, and they actually. Um, tend to nest in the ground compared to our cormorants that nest in trees. And at uh, certain parts of the year, particularly early autumn, the river drains and a whole load of gulls turn up as well, mostly black-headed and uh, black, uh, black-headed and lesser black back gulls. But occasionally we pick up Mediterranean gull uh, and common gull, which is actually quite rare down here. House martins are one of my favorites. I've got uh, three nesting on my balcony. And it's really fascinating. The London Wildlife Trust a few years ago did a, a survey to find out how many were nesting 
in London, in Greater London, and I realized that there were more pairs of house martin nesting on two sides of one building in Merida than the whole of London. London's total then was 200 pairs for the whole city. And I found 200 on two sides of one building. They are very common in extra Nigeria. Unfortunately, showing signs of decrease recently. Um, but anyway, you can see them almost throughout the year. In fact, my um, house martins only left maybe three weeks ago. But two years ago, I mean, you can see them all year. I mean, you can still see one or two flying around even now. But two, uh, two years ago, they started breeding in, a, in a, another town nearby on December the 14th. So I don't know whether that's climate change or what's going on there, but they are seemingly, seemingly nesting earlier. Serins are very common in the, in the town. Uh, Europe's smallest finch, a rarity in the UK, but you know, seen every year. Very, very cute little bird, the yellow rump, that's the male. Alpine swifts, pallid swifts, and common swifts are all to be seen. Alpine swifts stick around the longest. They stay into November, um, and then they go, and then they, they're back again March, April. So they don't go for that long. And there's a couple of colonies which are several hundred strong and are amazing to watch as they all wheel in the air. They actually breed on a Roman bridge. In fact, under the Roman bridge, in the arches, three different species of swift breed. Common, pallid, and alpine. Great opportunity to stand and just watch them at close quarters. And if you can catch them with your camera, good luck. It's amazing that they are so close to the city. And there's the uh, couple of alpines flying around with the Lusitania Bridge in the background. As I said earlier, black winged stilts are the order of the day. You see them everywhere. Beautiful, stunning birds, longest legs of any bird in relation to their size. Absolutely stunning. I'm glad they're, they're sort of more frequent in the UK, even though the reasons may not be good reasons. Um, as I said earlier, night herons are also quite prominent. Um, often to be seen, if you look very carefully, um, roosting in some of the trees along the edges of the river in Merida. But come, I mean, I spent lockdown here. So when I was in lockdown, I used to see them flying over habitually every evening. So they are to be seen. Purple swamp hen, more hen on steroids. I mean, it's just incredible. It's, it's, it's an amazing looking bird and this hue is incredible. When I first sort of came to Merida or to Extra Madura 10 years ago and I was looking for these birds from Roman Bridge, I kept on seeing more hens and saying, there's one there, there's one there. And then suddenly this behemoth steps out of the reeds and you think, ah, oh, that's one, <laughs> that's one. They are incredible. I've got a bit of footage here. Let's see if I can show you. This was, this was taken, I uh, took this uh, a couple of days ago. Apologies for the shakiness. I'm not sure if it translates well over the internet, but they are quite, well, they walk in and out of cover with equal ease and confidence. So you can stand somewhere and see them like this, and you can stand in the same place the next day and not see anything. It's a bit of potluck, but they are fabulous. Look at that massive beak. Incredible. Okay. Um, right, Chetty's warbler is another bird that we see and hear all the time. Um, it's funny, the Dutch, and I, I don't know, if I, please stop me if I bore you on this story, but I always love telling this. The Dutch apparently phonetically described the song as, hey, you, get out the car, you bastard. Because it sounds very kind of aggressive like that. <laughs> um, anyway, that's what they tell me. Um, black kites during the summer are quite common. There's quite a lot of them, and they're replaced in the winter by red kites. Um, they are scavengers, and there's a bunch of them that roost on the edge of the city, sometimes up to 500 birds roost in the trees along by the river. Beautiful. Um, vultures are a common daily sight. Griffin vulture in extra are fairly common. There's about four, 34,000 pairs. You can see them drifting over the center of the city. Black kites too um, are easily seen. There's about 900 pairs. This species has a range starting from Iberia over heading east over to Mongolia, but very patchily. And the population in uh, extra Madura is the biggest in the world. So you cannot fail to see them, and they are huge. 
absolutely huge. One of the best ways of telling them apart from the griffin is that when they fly overhead, if you can see the colour of their feet, then you know it's a black, a black vulture because the undertail coverts are black as well. So it shows the feet up very well, whereas the griffin vulture, you, can, you can't see his feet because a lot of his underparts are tan coloured. Um, the Iberian magpie is a species which you will see everywhere. However, in Merida itself, I've only seen three, in fact, four in 10 years on my patch. In fact, I saw one last week, actually. So I don't know why they don't occur within the middle of Merida, yet they occur within the middle of other cities in Extremadura. Beaters are, are stunning and they are to be seen, of course, during the summer. Um, these are common waxbills, again, very commonly seen quite indiscreet, but they make a sort of weird squeaky noise and they're quite small and they hang around in groups and they like being by the river. Um, this autumn, there's been, well, it's my first time I actually spent a long time in Spain in the autumn and I had a whole ton of these guys, pied flycatchers all over the place, along with spotted flycatchers. Um, this time of year also, I mean, blackcaps are found throughout the, summer, throughout the summer anyway, but there's a whole stack of them at the moment and they stay till the spring and they sing and a lot of them head off, but quite a few remain to breed. And if you can just see that chiff chaff, chiff chaff is probably the most common bird to be seen during the winter. It's like, they're like flies. You know, everywhere you walk, there's a bunch of them flying off somewhere. Um, there's a winter survey done of the breeding, sorry, the wintering birds in Extra Madura, and it's been found that Extra Madura has the most amount of individual wintering birds in the whole of Europe. So it's an incredible place for wildlife. Corn buntings are still common here, even though they've shown signs of decline as well. But there's, you know, you walk out into the country, but even in the city, I've seen them on my local patch, especially during the winter. They are everywhere to be seen, as are these guys. This is a Iberian shrike. This is a bit of a closer view. Um, and again, slightly more of a rosy hue to its chest compared to the Great Northern Great Northern, the Great Grey Shrike even, um, but to be seen everywhere. And during the summer, we also have Woodchat Shrike as well. And finally, on my little round trip of the urban delights of uh, Merida, Black Red Start, which is a winter visitor, um, suddenly appear and they're all over the place. And then come spring, they're all gone again. There's not many that breed in extra Madura, most of them breed in the mountains, but it's always a pleasure to see. Okay, from Spain and Merida, we're going to switch all the way over to one of my favorite places in Asia, Taiwan. Um, I love it there. I've been there a couple of times. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's a really fascinating place to go birding, uh, especially well, all over the place, but in Taipei, the capital, lots to be seen. Um, this is a maroon oriole, uh, very similar, I suppose, in build to a golden oriole. And the song is kind of like a golden oriole, but different but a bird that's seen in lots of the parks during the summer. Um, this weird creature is in fact a coltit, and coltits in Taiwan have crests like that. It's incredible. But did you know that in Britain there are two species of tit with crests? And they are the crested tit, of course, and our very own coltit. It's got a little wisp of a crest. If anyone is a ringer, Maybe you'll know this, but they actually have a little wisp of a crest. Now, I've, I've actually never, I've only ever seen the crest a couple of times. Am I frozen? Like, yeah, good. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you're live or not. Um, near the city was a park, and I remember standing in this park, and this uh, nutcracker landed on this interpretation board. The woman didn't notice. She turned around and jumped out of her skin because it was right close to her. And then she took a picture of it, and I thought that was excellent. That's another example of people interacting with nature. You know, she took a picture of this bird, and it was just brilliant. I love seeing people who think they have no interest become interested. And that's what it's all about. It's just that little nugget. That's all you need. Um, in Taiwan, we also have the white whiskered laughing thrush, which is also called by non birders the iPhone bird. And the reason why it's called the iPhone bird is that you can actually just walk up to it and take pictures. It's a very photogenic bird, doesn't care about people. It just uh, does its thing. And I love them, fantastic. Um, one of the main species that people come to Taiwan for is this. This is a swin hose pheasant. It's an endemic. It looks absolutely stunning, guys. I mean, 
that iridescence is so incredible to see in real life. The first one I saw was in uh, sort of a rainy day and it's got this white blaze in its back and the white blaze, like a badger's white blaze, it was just so, it just kicked out. But it's such a gorgeous bird, stunning. And this is the other endemic that people come to see. This is the um, Mikado pheasant and its plumage looks like crushed velvet. It's just, the, this is the male, it's just absolutely stunning. Absolutely beautiful bird. Whilst I was looking for the Mikado pheasant, I came across these Taiwan partridge, which uh, apparently are quite scarce and hard to see. Uh, so we're lucky to come across a Kobe of a few of those guys. But when you're birding in cities, it's not always all about looking up. Sometimes you need to look down. And when you look down, you see things like this. And then you look up and you see something like that. That is a Malaysian night heron, which is found in Southeastern Asia. But in Taipei, for some reason, they don't care about people. They walk out in the open in parks with no undergrowth and stand like bittens with their heads up when you come too close to them thinking that we can't see them. They are so confiding compared to other places in Asia. So uh, it's one of those birds that I will always think of when I think of Taiwan. So that's my whistle stop tour of uh, Taipei. I'm gonna take it to one more place and it's a place that I talk about all the time. So it may be no surprise to some of you guys. And that place is Serbia. And in particular, this area up here by the Hungarian border. Um, I first went to Serbia about 12 years ago. I thought I'd hate it there given the, you know, the atrocities that happened in Serbia in the 90s. Um, but it turned out when I got there that the people are really, really nice. So very friendly, um, hospitable people. And my guide took me to a park in the northern part of Serbia near the Hungarian border when he saw me shaking and needing some urban birding fix. So he took me to a small town, we went into a wood, into a park actually, a wooded park, and we walked around and all of a sudden I looked up and there was this long-eared owl which was looking back at us and my um, guide called it and it looked down. And then I looked around, there were 22, this is during the spring, 22 breeding pairs of long-eared owls nesting semi-colonially, some, some of them out in the open, in this wood with rooks, um, in a rookery actually, with 35 pairs of common kestrel. I've never seen so many kestrels together in one spot. And 10 pairs of red-legged, sorry, red-footed red falcon. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. So my guide said to me, I actually said to him, how the hell? I mean, why are there so many of them? He said, well, basically, um, the thing is, the farming in Serbia is very much like Britain was back in the, you know, 200 years ago. It's, it's, they don't sort of harvest all the crop. They actually keep um, the grain in barns with no walls. So there's grain everywhere and even in the fields. So there's a profusion of rodents, which are fed upon during the day by kestrels and by night by the long-eared owls. And they nest in boxes like this, or they nest in wicker baskets, open wicker baskets, you know, in the open. Okay. Have you ever seen a little a long-eared owl nesting in the open? In fact, have you ever seen long-eared owls nest full stop? Because I never had before. So after that massive shock, I decided to come back in the winter, and I've done every year since, bringing people to see the wonders of the owl population that winters in northern Serbia. I take them to Serbia by night. We get to our hotel at night. We have our dinner. We go for a little walk in the hotel grounds. You might see an owl. Everyone's getting excited. Oh my God, I've just seen an owl. It's a long-eared owl. Because a lot of these people hadn't seen a long-eared owl ever in their lives. So it's great for them to see it. And I'm thinking to myself, you haven't seen anything yet. So the next couple of days we're walking around town and we're seeing owls hanging out in the trees in the streets, in the parks, in the cemeteries. And there's a few owls around. And excuse me to, for this bit of owl porn, but I just love looking at these guys. And even, they even come out sometimes when they're flushed to land on man-made structures. 
But I took um, the group to Kikinda, which is now world famous. At the time, 10 years ago, no one ever heard of it. Um, it's the capital, the world capital for Long Edels. And in their town square, um, between sort of late December and into kind of late February, perhaps early March, you can walk around and this square has, you know, normal things you find in the square, which would be, you know, churches and a few trees and all that sort of stuff. But you can walk around and see upwards of 800, as a record, 800 long-eared owls in the trees staring down at you. It's like being on a Harry Potter set. It's just incredible to, to see so many owls <laughs> in one hit. And I just love looking at the faces of the people I bring because they are just absolutely stunned by the numbers of owls. Um, a lot of research has been done into the owls. Um, we still don't know exactly where all of them come from. We think that some uh, actually emanate from Russia and, and the East. Um, there's a good healthy population that actually nests in Serbia anyway. And also there's owls to be found in Hungary and Romania, but nowhere as concentrated as this. In fact, across the whole of Northern Serbia, it's been guesstimated that there's 22,000 individual owls roosting, wintering in that area. And when you think that in Britain, the population probably no more than two or 3,000 pairs, it just kind of puts it into perspective. Um, we've also found that short-eared owls are taken to nesting, or well, not nesting, sorry, sorry, roosting with these guys. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I've never seen short-eared owls roosting with long-eared owls before until very recently, so it's quite, quite cool. But I think the, the, the long and short of it is, um, the ecotourism that now is to be found in this region, particularly in Kikinda, has changed people's views. Uh, these urban people in the past used to hunt the owls thinking that they were birds of doom, but now they see them as ways of making much needed cash. And the ecotourism is kicking off. There's now in the square um, shops where you can actually go and buy souvenirs of owls, t-shirts and cups and tea towels. Uh, kids, I mean, in, in uh, Serbia, owls are called Soba. So they're renamed November, Sovemba. Sorry, they're renamed November, Sovemba. And uh, kids dress up as owls during that month. It's just incredible. But the best thing of all, uh, the government have made that square a nature reserve. And anyone that actually is found disturbing the owls, like at Christmas, putting up bunting and lights, can be fined up to 10,000 euros. That is fantastic. That shows that you don't have to go to the middle of nowhere to see amazing things. Sometimes these things are right under our noses. So with that, I'd like to thank you all tonight uh, for, for coming along and listening to me. I hope you enjoyed it. So it's a bit weird doing it over, over the internet and I hope it came across okay. Um, obviously, if you've got any questions, I'm, I'd love to answer them. But uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Thank you so much, David. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm going to go into the question and answer session now, if you're ready to take some questions. Sure. Ah, thank you. So question number one from our audience. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Um, do you know if buzzards are able to hold a territory and breed successfully in urban areas? I live within one kilometre of Sheffield city centre and have an urban park near my home. A buzzard and sometimes two together are often seen here, sometimes soaring, feeding on the ground or roosting in trees. Could they have had a nest and rear young somewhere like this? And if so, what do they feed on? I think it's very possible, actually. I mean, they certainly nest in urban areas in, in uh, Europe. Uh, I've seen them in various cities, right in the heart of cities. And I've seen, you know, I've seen um, buzzards um, in cities in, in the UK, including London. I know for sure, but in London, they nest on the outskirts in some of the larger parks and, and gardens. So there's no reason why they would not be nesting um, quite close to you guys here in, or there in Sheffield. Um, so yeah, I, I can see that, but I, I don't think it's that common yet. It's like, for example, with ravens, they've uh, I'm begun to make, beginning to make a comeback into urban areas too. Um, but it's interesting how some species 
um, are more adept at uh, urban life than others uh, in terms of different areas of their population. So the raven is a great example. In the UK, you know, they are scarce, rare in urban areas, really. I mean, they do breed, I think, on the outskirts of London, I'm sure elsewhere. But if you go to somewhere like Los Angeles, they're living downtown with the American crows, you know, they're hanging out all together. So it's quite interesting how that all works. Um, what they feed on, well, the buzzards are, uh, they feed on carrion and also hunt things like rabbits and stuff like that. But it's a bit tough really with this country because unfortunately, you know, we are decimating our countryside with pesticides and things like that, which makes things a lot harder to, to find. But that said, the buzzard is actually the most common bird of prey in the UK now, spread predominant, uh, prolifically actually. I think it's about 30,000 pairs now. They're actually more common than the kestrel. So I would say that there is a good chance that they could be nesting nearby. So keep, keep your eye out and see if you can find them in a large wood. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question, um, do you think Sheffield will regret not culling the um, ring-necked parakeets as they start to appear? Do, you, do, I, do, you, do I think that Sheffield, sorry, do, do people regret having ring, ring that power case in Sheffield? Um, do, do we think that we, Sheffield, uh, we will regret not culling them as they start to appear? Oh, culling them. It's too late. Culling is too late. I mean, that sort of stuff should have been done right at the very beginning. Um, and plus, I think too many people will be against that now. They culled the other parrot species, uh, the monk parakeet, before that really began to expand even though there may still be some birds um, existing. The, the monk parakeet is different to the, uh, the ringnet in that it's the only parrot in the world that makes its own nest. So they make these towers of sticks on top of telegraph poles and stuff like that. They come from uh, Southern America and in places like Argentina, they're, they're deemed as pests because their nests, their colonial nests get so big and heavy they weigh as much as a small car that at some point the structure beneath it collapses and it's a danger to, to people. And I think that's part of the reason why they were culled in the UK alongside the fact that they are fruit farm pests as well. The ringneck parakeet kind of snuck up on us. You know, one minute, you know, one or two were seen flying around and people were thinking, oh, is that an escape parrot? Is that a escape pet or something? And then all of a sudden, bam, there's like 4,000 and 10,000. Um, so I think it's too late and I think maybe a few too many people love them now for that to happen so we just have to learn to live with the noise and hope for peregrines uh, expanded numbers and kill quite a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much um what would you suggest to help us at the trust to make bird watching cool for young people from a range of different backgrounds that is a <clears throat> very big question which cannot <laughs> cannot be answered in one sentence or even a paragraph because it's a, it's, there's a lot of things that needs to be done really. And I think, to be honest, I think it's a bigger thing than just the trust do what they need to do, even though the trust obviously does need to try and engage with all walks of life. Um, but I think the bigger scheme of things is that we need to have more education in our schools. Um, Cause I think a lot of people, um, uh, especially people from ethnically diverse backgrounds, feel that it's not for them to be out there watching nature and stuff and part of that is cultural and part of that is the bigger problem which is how nature is sold in the first place it's sold as far as i'm concerned as a pursuit of the countryside and even now um, especially in the urban areas there's nothing much on tv to try and convince people that there's stuff to see or to start your interest in, in urban areas you know, you just have to look on TV to see that. And I think that there needs to be more done. I mean, during lockdown, the first lockdown, a massive trick was missed by the broadcasters, I felt, because instead of, you know, they should have sent people out with a camera and say, hey, take this camera, walk around the streets of Sheffield, shoot what you see, or make a film and see, you know, just to show people what, you know, what's around. But that wasn't done. And I think there's still this emphasis on showing, you know, stuff that's away from where we are. So ordinary people watching this think, well, you know, I will never see that. That's unattainable. It's in the middle of the countryside away from prying eyes. I mean, I love all the stuff that David Attenborough does. It's amazing. But I fear that there's this danger that the bar's getting higher and higher and higher 
I mean, the technical ability of the cameraman is amazing and the equipment, all that's great. But it becomes a source of entertainment to the point that once the TV switched off, the connection's gone. And people don't think or feel that where they are in the world, i.e. Sheffield or London or wherever you are, is connected to whatever they've been watching. When in reality, there should be a lot more done to show that connection. So I think that's where the problems are. Um, they're the main problems that need to be addressed at the same time as you guys talking to the local kids and try and engage them with urban wildlife. Yes, thank you very much. And we also want to say thank you because we'll be using your presentation and sharing that, you know, with our local schools and our, our local community groups. So, you know, we're already trying to sort of reach out to those groups um, and thank you for letting us use your content to do that as well. Um, so just moving on to the next question. So um, Sheffield City Centre seems very bare, lots of paving and almost no birds. How can we persuade developers to let there um, be some wild spots to encourage more birds? Um, and and um, another person has said, take a leaf out of Singapore's book with regard to green building design. Yeah, I think, again, that's a, for me, that's an easy question to answer, which is to, to convince um, developers to build less gray and more green and blue. So when they're building estates or whatever, build a pond and a woods at the same time or and incorporate that, those kind of elements in there so that people who live in that area grow up seeing these things as, as normal and not feeling the inclination to dump their rubbish in it. I think, you know, I'm working actually funny enough with a couple of developers or a developer actually in the UK um, who is very, very committed to developing along those lines, having areas where there's um, hedgehog runs, you know, it's already placed in. And when people actually move in, they are asked to maintain these things for wildlife. And also more emphasis must be put upon existing householders, if that's possible, to stop them from making their front gardens into car parks and their back gardens completely patioed over with AstroTurf. We need to try and get more people to realize that we need to have you know, this green and blue and natural stuff within our cities. And it goes back again to what I said earlier, not enough is done by the main media to, to illustrate this. And I point my finger squarely at things like Springwatch and all those guys, because they're very keen to show us the seals you know, up in Scotland and the deer, that's all lovely, but let's have a look at what's actually around us. Let's get people engaged at that level and then they can expand their minds to realize that oh yeah we've got hairs and stuff as well but we also got stuff right in our garden so we need to have more programming more media attention on things like that to get that message across it's so important thank you um next question what time of the day is the best for bird watching in towns um i think um i mean birds can turn up anywhere at any time um, but in cities, I mean, my urban birding, I've always kind of done or usually opt to go for the first thing in the morning. Um, on my patch of wormwood scrubs, for example, in the morning, I just meet with dog walkers. Um, and it's normally, you know, even before dog walkers come out, I'm sometimes totally on my own. And especially during migration time, birds, especially small birds, migrate by night and they make landfall before dawn and they're busily feeding. And often that's the best time to see them as they're gorging themselves, replenishing their energy and, you know, they're less afraid. Because that's another good thing about urban birding. A lot of the birds are actually used to people, so you can actually see them a lot easier than you would do in the sort of same habitat in, in a more rural area. So the morning's good, but, you know, any time of day can be good. I mean, I, I've, I've often gone out during the course of the day or even before, you know, before sunset and still find things. But there's something magical about the morning. I love being somewhere and watching the sun come up. And, you know, I remember once being on my patch um, early morning in May, early May, and I remember getting there and the sun was just rising and I heard a nightingale singing. And it was like the hairs came off the back of my neck. I was thinking, oh my God, I'm hearing a nightingale. I can see the shard and I can see, you know, all the buildings in central London and I'm surrounded by urbanity. And there's this nightingale singing by me. It's just incredible. Wow, it's, it sounds really, really magical. Um, we're just going to do three more questions, David, because um, um, we are running over slightly. So 
with climate change and its impact on the UK seasons, what species do you think we can look forward to seeing and um, in Sheffield or locally? And which species do you think will struggle? Which species, so I've got to miss the last so one. Which species will thrive or we can look forward to seeing and which species will struggle? Well, I mean, I think it's been played out as we speak. I mean, you know, some species like the little egret, um, you know, spreading north, Chetty's warbler is another one. Um, and other species like the, uh, the black wing stilt, they all seem to be kind of making their way into the UK, great egrets and other. Whereas there's other species um, which uh, who are suffering because of this whole climate change scenario. And some of them are migratory species because, I mean, I think there's anecdotal evidence regarding cuckoos and the fact that they are having to, to fly a bigger expanse of desert because desertification is actually increasing at a rate which is sort of faster than what they can adapt to. Um, and also by the time they get here um, into Britain, um, because our springs are earlier, birds already have chicks in their nests, so there might be less chance for a cuckoo to, to lay its egg in, in, a, in a nest. And similarly, um, the other way around, when these birds migrate to Africa, some of the areas that they go to might not exist anymore because of climate change. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very sort of sad scenario, really, and I think that, you know, we, we can do stuff here, but it needs to be done on an international level because it's one, it's one thing saving areas in, in a part of their migrational route, but you've got to save the whole path in order for the species to actually thrive. But yeah, there's, there's going to be winners and losers, and some of them may not necessarily be as obvious as, uh, as we may think. I mean, there's the new theory about how sparrows decline, and that's the fact that it's uh, avian malaria and avian malaria has been spread because of climate change because the mosquitoes are moving north and that's a bird you would never expect to be affected by climate change so it's going to hit us in very different ways thank you very much and um a question two good questions from jasmine age 10 do bee eaters eat bees and do laughing birds laugh <laughs> laughing birds laughing thrushes or laugh you talking about laughing thrushes yeah um, I don't know actually because the sounds they make didn't sound like laughing to me but you know open to interpretation I suppose. Um, yeah bee eaters do eat uh, bees I mean I've seen one I remember one watch, watching one eating this massive bee in Spain. Um, it's interesting because um, in Extra Medjuda, um as, as much as there's lots of nature and as much as people live uh, a lot of people live a very rural life there was also lots of backward thinking and there was an instance a couple of years ago when certain beekeepers were angering, basically trying to get angling uh, for bees to be culled because they were saying that their beehives were being raided by bees to the extent that the bees were, you know, wiped out and they, they wait by the beehive to catch the bees and I thought that doesn't sound right and apparently someone put out a, a uh, a camera, a cam, a cam recorder, um, and left it out um, by the beehive and found that in fact this beehive in particular has been raided by a guy nicking the honey. So, you know, it's funny how sometimes people use birds as scapegoats. But yes, they, they eat bees and other insects. Um, and I love, love the sound as well. For me, being here during lockdown, um, I was here. Uh, just as spring was emerging and in Spain we couldn't walk anywhere so I was literally confined to the house apart from going to the shop down again and I sit on the terrace and I remember the day I heard a bee eater it was like oh, you know I felt as if I'd been rescued it was amazing to hear them calling overhead and they actually nest nearby uh, in, in the, uh, in the, in the um, building site nearby so it was really nice to see them and then another bird that occasionally show up in the UK and have nested in the past and may nest more in the past, in the future due to uh, the situation of the, the changing climate. Thank you. I hope that answered your questions, Jasmine. Um, so your final question of the evening before we let you all go is which species or avian phenomenon would you still like to tick off your bucket list? 
Hmm. You're talking to a man who's not a lister, but I do keep lists, but I'm not, you know, when I go places, I don't really go to tick things off. I, whatever I see, I'll see. But I think one of the things that I'd love to see, um, there's several, I mean, one I've already seen, I've always wanted to see a Sabine's girl. I've never seen one and I didn't want a Twitch one. Um, and I remember I was in uh, a place called Punta Arenas, which is the most, one of the most southerly towns in Chile. So basically next stop is Antarctica. And I was walking along the coast, looking at the local bird life. And I saw this bird that I thought, that looks familiar. And it turned out to be a Sabine skull. And it was my first and only. And it turned out also to be the most southerly record for the Sabine skull in Chile. So that was a double whammy. That was fantastic. I've never seen a snowy owl. And again, I refuse to twitch one. I want to see them naturally. So that's one bird I'd love to see. But I think the bird above all that I'd love to discover um, before I die, and that is Eskimo curlew, which is a species which most people deem as being extinct. The last uh, notable record was back in 1962 in Texas. I think, um, just to explain what they were, a species of curlew that used to nest in their millions in the Arctic Canadian tundra and then migrate through the Great Plains, stop at the Great Plains to feed on this grasshopper, which is the sort of uh, local sort of species in that area, to fatten up and then fly on over the Gulf of Mexico and end up in the Pampas. But then when the European settlers came, they just shot all of them, all of them. And um, as I say, there's been records or people think they've seen them every now and again. I just love to go to Canada and rediscover one breeding. That'd be amazing for me. So Eskimo Curly is my ultimate bird that I'd love to find and see. Thank you. We would love to hear about it if you ever did see one. <laughs> um, so that's all of our questions. Apologies to anyone who asked questions that we didn't get round to, but we are uh, running over time. So I'm just going to wrap it up there. I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to David. It's been really interesting and informative and funny. And um, if you get a chance to read through the chats, you can see all the, the lovely feedback from our um, participants. I also want to thank everyone for coming this evening. Um, and your ongoing support of the trust is really valued. And you know all your kind donations for coming tonight, you'll have a real impact. Um, all that money will go towards our nature reserves. Um, and you know so we can continue to work and protect wildlife in the local area. Um, just to let you know, on the 17th of December, we have another online event. Our patron, Mike Dilger, is coming to do a presentation, an update on what he's been up to. So we'd love to welcome you all back. So we'll send around details about that. And David, we'd love to welcome you as a participant if you'd like to join us. Um, but from us, I'd like to say once again, massive thank you to David and to everyone that's been here. And we will see you all again soon. So thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.